It's always amazed me that dogs' noses are sensitive enough to detect the smell of diseases. From malaria to Parkinson's, various cancers, even low blood sugar levels in diabetics. With a bit of training, they can signal when they know something's up. Last week I got the opportunity to talk to a team that are borrowing some lessons from this capability to develop a robotic platform that could detect early signs of disease in blood samples. Hi, I'm Ben. This week I want to show you deep into a technology that I pretty much can guarantee you you haven't seen before. Looking for an answer to that age-old question, can you teach a robot to smell disease? Modern medicine is at a really interesting stage of development at the moment. We've become exceptionally capable at diagnosing illnesses that present a single or maybe very few strongly correlated biomarkers, chemical signatures in something like the blood. But we find it incredibly hard to do diagnostics where there isn't a specific target to look for. In most uh, biosensing applications, they work by examining the levels of one particular biomarker. So a biomarker is any biological signal which can be detected. So it could be levels of a protein, a fatty acid, it could be a genetic signal. And, and these are great. And there are some diseases which are really easy to characterize according to one particular biomarker. The problem being that all of that low hanging fruit has already been picked. And now the, the real problem space is around diseases where there is no biomarker or there's no obvious biomarker or the biomarkers only appear late when it's too late to kind of meaningfully treat that disease. When a disease smelling dog goes to work, what they are detecting with each sniff is a complex cocktail of molecular biomarkers that emerge in the sweat or other bodily fluids, which may aerosolize and ultimately reach one of the 300 million receptors in the dog's nose. Each receptor doesn't sense a particular smell or compound in particular. There's no strawberry receptor or no coffee receptor, disappointingly. Receptors instead come in types that respond to broad categories of smells with greater or lesser responsiveness. Humans have about 400 different types of receptors and about 6 million receptors in total, a few percentage points of a dog's capability. The relative response intensity of each type of receptor creates a fingerprint unique to that smell. Your brain checks that fingerprint against the sense it's learned to recognize to determine what that smell is. The process is called differential sensing, looking at the different response levels across many different receptors. Rosa are trying to replicate this process, but for liquids, specifically to detect diseases in blood. That could, I guess, be more analogous to a tongue, but I thought the idea of tasting diseases was gross, so we'll stay with smelling diseases for the time being. The artificial receptors that Rosa are developing are tiny biological structures that they assemble from individual peptide chains, tiny little chains of proteins. So we work with a class of peptides called alpha helical barrels, and essentially what that means is that they're made from alpha helices. So this is a very small representation of one of those spirals, and you can essentially print these things on a, on a peptide synthesizer, and you can decide exactly which amino acid goes next in that chain. And by controlling the residues on one side, what you can do essentially is you can design a matching peptide uh, with matching residues so those things come together and they stick like that. The really exciting thing is when you make five alpha helices, they pop out and essentially create a small hole down the center. And because uh, of the fact that these uh, are peptides, you can control uh, the characteristics of the amino acids that line the inside of this, uh, of this tube. You can also, by controlling the number of alpha helices, control the size of that pore. So we have a representation of a medium sized pore and a very large pool there. And this is the fundamental core aspect to our sensing technology. With control of the different sizes of barrel and the amino acids that are inside the pool, Rosa can create different types of receptor. Some samples will occupy and strongly bind to the inside of those barrels, maybe because the charges, the geometry or particular structure of the sample or of the pore, other samples won't bind nearly as effectively. And these are analogous to those different categories, those different types of smell receptors. But here, they work in liquid rather than in scent. The question that's really interesting though, is how do you know how well each barrel is interacting with this sample? For smell receptors, each receptor has a dedicated neuron that takes that signal and sends it straight back to the brain. How does Rosa actually go about detecting whether a barrel is binding well or not binding well to a particular sample? So what happens essentially is you create these things, you print them out really cheap, cheaply and easily, and you embed a fluorescent dye within the center of this barrel. Uh, the really cool thing about that fluorescent dye is that it fluoresces when it's stuck inside the barrel, 
and then uh, once it's kicked out of that barrel, it no longer fluoresces. So you can essentially get a proxy for a binding event based on the fluorescence uh, that you're getting from this barrel. So you basically know how strongly a receptor is reacting to a particular sample based on the level of decrease of fluorescence that you see. By placing a different type of each barrel into a 384 well plate, essentially 384 tiny test tubes, they build their artificial nose. When they drop in some sample into each of those wells, each well will produce a different level of fluorescent signal in response, depending on how well these samples kick out the fluorescent dye from the barrel. This gives Rosa a fluorescent fingerprint for each sample. I asked Andy if we could take a look in the lab at this process from start to finish and also to meet some of the team. I will warn you that there is a huge amount of quite loud equipment running in the lab so the audio level isn't perfect, but I hope you get a sense of what this company is doing on a day-to-day -day basis. We use um, this device, it's called a multi-drop, within a biosafety hood to dispense our samples and controls onto the 384 well plates in order then to analyze them on the fluorescent plate reader. And so what sort of samples yeah. would you be looking at? Um, so any samples that a doctor would withdraw from a patient um, that may be taken out as part of a surgery process or if you go to your GP and um, blood is drawn from the blood then serum is made. These are fluorescence dyes that we have loaded into our bells and upon the addition of our analyte, those dyes are removed out of the barrel um, and we can measure that change with the fluorescence reader. Yeah, so basically what, what will happen is you'll get each of the each of the wells in these places has a different barrel and a different dye in it. You'll excite it, you'll collect the data, that'll give us our fingerprints. Then we take all of that data and we use that to train machine learning algorithms. So these numbers here are the raw fluorescence values across the plate? and that's um, a signal which we then normalise and then standardise and use to actually differentiate the different samples. So I've got a little box spot down here which summarises it too. So these are the blanks where the water is and these are the analytes. So you can see there's a bit of a difference between the fluorescence and it's that signal that we use. And how, how much like training do you actually need to do on a disease candidate or something until the, the system actually starts to understand and recognise it? Not very much. Like actually it's really simple. A lot of this you can kind of see by eye already. So the machine learning just kind of ties up these ends at the end. Like the power is really in the, the wells and the technology. The really counterintuitive part to me here is that you aren't looking for anything in particular. Analytical science brain of mine would always expect tests to come back saying low levels of potassium, high levels of sodium, uh, the wrong levels of this particular protein marker, etc. To extrapolate from that what your disease might be. Rosa's technology can't and doesn't try and do anything to do with that. Because blood is made up of millions of different biomarkers, it's incredibly complex. The goal for Rosa isn't to look for individual components of the mixture, but instead to look at how the sample as a whole interacts with their sensors, which I think is a really interesting kind of paradigm change to the typical way we go about doing these sorts of process, which is usually quite analytically. This approach, differential sensing approaches, techniques, are often met with some skepticism, as they feel a bit like a black box, when it's hard to really understand what exactly is happening in them. As long as the science is sound and the right clinical studies have been conducted to show the efficacy that these techniques are detecting specific diseases accurately, Differential sensing is an opportunity to fundamentally rewrite how we think about supporting human health. At the moment, we largely wait until we feel ill or we notice some symptoms to seek treatment, but this can mean that we aren't as quick to start treatments, which ultimately can impact the outcomes. Rose's technology is still early, but it has shown some really compelling early results so far. If you found this interesting, I actually had the opportunity to do a sit down podcast with Andy, where he talked a little bit more about how his business works, what they're trying to do, and how he found himself in the role of starting a company based on very early stage fundamental science. If you're interested, I'll leave a link to it in the description down below. Thanks very much for watching. I'll see you next time. Goodbye.